to call your attention to the fact that you are not only being welcomed, but you are being blessed, blessed of the Lord, in joining me in this prophetical journey into Revelation and the prophecies of this special book. The book of Revelation is the prophetical manual of the Church of Jesus Christ. There is no other way that the Church can be led of the Holy Spirit except by this prophetical map. It's a map. It's the, the prophetical geography of the Church. This is how we know where we are and we know where we're going. And we know what is happening around us according to God's own revelation. According to the newspaper, the news media, we are told every 24 hours around the clock, on television, through radio and newspapers and magazines, we are told, even by lecturers of all kinds, from political lecturers to religious lecturers and conferences and sermons, we are told about so many things and so many facts, but we're still not knowing what God is thinking about everything else. We need to know how God we see things and not only read about and hear about, but we must see. This is the time to see. Never before in the history of civilization has come human race more closer and closer to prophecy and fulfillment of prophecy as this time. We are surrendered by prophecy every second. As a matter of fact, fractions of seconds. There is no even time in our clocks that can register the amount of prophecies that are being fulfilled before our very eyes. This is why even the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that prophecy is like a torch in the midst of darkness. It's light. It's the light of the church. It's the, it's the map of the church. It's the geography of the church, where the church will know where it's going, what is happening around her. is something else is the light that brings understanding and faith to the non-believer. It is how the church can transmit the commission of Christ given to his apostles. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whosoever shall believe and be baptized shall be saved, and whosoever shall not believe shall be damned. Is this great commission that has been implemented by prophecy right now, at this very moment, as you watch me, as you hear me, prophecy are implementing the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What comfort, what a way so safe to walk. Listen to this. It's so safe that we are called blessed. Listen. Revelation chapter 1, join with me in the reading, chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as a matter of fact, as I said before, while we were bringing to your attention the prophecies concerning the rider of the white horse, the prophecies concerning the rider of the red horse, and the prophecies concerning the rider of the black horse, now I call your attention to the prophecies relate to the rider of the pale horse. We are, in all these prophecies, all together, we are witnessing, not just hearing, but witnessing as witnesses of Jesus Christ, what the Lord is revealing. And this is why I said this book is special. You know why? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Never before Jesus Christ has been revealed and all the fulfillment of his glory and his grace and his love and his justice and his power and his kingdom and his glory never before has been revealed has been revealed in this book now we want to lead you to that fulfillment to that climax concerning your approaching christ as your lord and savior not only but as your advocate before God and you. As a sinner, you have that prevention. You have that blessing. You have that promise that he become an advocate between God and yourself. He is your attorney, your lawyer, 
whatever matter has to be dealt with in judgment, Christ will be there for you as you approach your day of salvation. And Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith and faith alone. Faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hear again, and see the promise for those who already are there, believing the gospel. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw, not that he hear, that he saw. This is what I said. This book is specialized in seeing, not just in hearing and reading, but the book, this revelation, is specialized in the emphasis to see. We are here today, in this contemporary history, we are to see. The apostles and prophets, even from the Old Testament, they never witnessed what you and I witnesses today. From every riot in the streets, to every city, to every nation, from every volcanic eruption, from any seismic movement of the earth, from any, any disaster, from any plan, everything that move upon this planet today is a continual fulfillment of prophecy. Again, we are surrounded by prophecy. Here is why the church, the servants of God, the people of God must be up to date in prophecy. Because it is light in the midst of darkness. How, uh, even more, uh, let's, let's even go deeper and further into this glorious experience. Let's say that even prophecy today is precisely what is a gift of the Holy Spirit is given to the church as one of the highest, among the highest gift. Some people are putting more emphasis on some other gift, I don't know why, and I don't know even how they do uh, in order to manage such important to other gift, when even prophecy is the one that was given only with exclusion, with a special exclusivity, was given to the church for edification. Prophecy is the one that built up the church, is the one that make the church grow. Prophecy. This is why, again, the angel revealed that this book especially is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Every book of the Bible is the revelation of God. It's God revealing everything that he wants from you, everything that he has for you, everything that goes from you to him and from him to you. All the books of the Bible. But the book of Revelation, with a specialty, is the climax of all the goodness of God being revealed in this last book of the Bible. The book has not only a specialty and being so there is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but about what the book brings to our life. What this book brings to our life. Why I'm saying all this about this book is coming to the conclusion, or at least coming to the end of the Four Horsemen, we are to encourage you to read more of the book of Revelation, to read more, to study more, to even come closer to see what is being written here, surrounded your life, your house, your family, your work, your industry, your society where you're living. You are able now, after more reading, after more studying of the book of Revelation, you are able now not only to read, not only to understand, but now you are able to see, to see what is being fulfilled from these very prophecies here in this book. Who bear record of the word of God, verse 2, and a testimony of Jesus Christ and all of the things that he saw, Blessed is that he that read it, and they that hear the word of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. That is what we said and we repeat now. The closer 
that we get to the fulfillment of this prophecy, the closer that Jesus Christ is to you. The closer that the Lord Jesus Christ is closer to his church for his coming and his reunion with his bride, his wife, the church. Listen now in Revelation chapter 3 what this angel has to reveal as Jesus Christ himself opened the seal, what the angel has to reveal about the rider of the pale horse. Let's read in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, beginning now with verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I hear the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. Again, come and see. And I looked, not I hear, I looked. And behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. Now, it's impressive to know that the rider of the white horse bear no name, that the rider of the red horse bear no name, and the rider of the black horse bear no name, but the rider of the pale horse bear name. In conclusion, the angel revealed and Christ revealed to his church that this pale horse, pale horse the rider of this pale horse, is the final solution that the reversion of the gospel has brought about upon this earth. Now that is the final solution for those who have revealed against the gospel and for those who prefer religious tradition and a religious authority rather than the authority of the Bible and rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a very bad solution, death, because those who obey the gospel and those who believe that the final authority is the Bible and matters of belief and matters of faith will be given no death, will be given life, eternal life. And when he hath opened this fourth field, I hear the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I look and behold a pale horse, and his name that said on him was death, and hell followed with him. What that means is, there is no other alternative after this. I mean, there is nothing more after that. This is final. It's not only death, but it's hell. And precisely, death and hell will be brought at the end of everything, will be brought to the lake of fire, this very book said. Follow with him, not just hell follow him, follow with him. What that means is that those who are following the rider of the pale horse, those who are forming part of the pale horse, and we will know very soon who are the ones that compose that pale horse. Even the color bring revelation about those who identify with the pale horse, with the rider. Listen to this. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Now, some people said that we are doing better than many years ago. Even medical doctors said that you are getting older but at the same time healthier. I don't know where those facts are because uh, the real facts are others. And medical doctors and medical science know it very well. Certainly, we live longer today, but you suffer more today than even a year ago. <gasps> Isn't that impressive? Why? Because the more scientific benefits that we enjoy, the more suffering that is taking place in this earth. It doesn't minimize. All the scientific improvement of this planet is bringing more complications, as a matter of fact, even to the ecology of the planet, from heavens down to water and earth. The result 
of what? The result of scientific improvement. The result of scientific progress is bringing more destruction, more complications, more diseases, no less. Listen to this. The last statistic from Atlanta, Georgia, from the Center for Investigations of the Diseases in the United States, tell us there are thousands upon thousands of virus, new virus. They speak, they talk about new virus. They are not talking about old virus they knew not. They are talking about the implementation of new virus, new bacteria they discover every single day. Beside the old bacteria and the old virus. Now where all these new virus are coming from? With so much of progress, with so much medicine, with so much of progress, why new virus are being built up to a rate that even scientists around the world cannot keep up with? The tremendous acceleration of the multiplication and birth of new virus, new bacteria. Among others, you know, AIDS, a virus that has brought about the most horrifying plague in the history of civilization. Already, you can qualify the stat. For the year 2000, over 100 million people will be under eight. Over 100 million. And we are very close to the year 2000. Now listen to this. Let's go to the color, as we are concluding now with the four colors. As you will watch, by watching right now, by seeing, you will see these colors. You will see the combinations of color, I will call, the combination of color. First, I call your attention to the fact that the white color and the pale color symbolize one special flag that is already in the United Nations. <gasps> a flag representing a power a flag representing a country is here already in prophecy? Is here in prophecy. A flag. If you understand, a flag is a very symbolic of the power of a nation. It's the symbol of a country not only. It's the symbol of that reality as a nation, as a government, as people. Where is this flag? Wait, listen. Is the one of the flags that are becoming more relevant more relevant than the communist flag used to be. Now, as the communist flag is fading away, this white and pale flag is becoming more relevant. It's replacing the communist flag, has replaced the fascist flag, it's replacing almost every other country flag, because right now, this is the only flag that you see waving next to the flag of other countries when the Pope arrived to every country. That is the flag of the Vatican. If you care to see, it's white and pale. Now you're not going to tell me that this is coincidence. Oh, he's talking about coincidence. This is just coincidence. It happened to be that this is the flag of the Vatican, and it happened to be that the rider of the white horse is the Pope, and it's coincidence that the rider of the pale horse have by for name death and hell follow with him. Is all this coincidence? Well, there are too many coincidences, don't you believe? Too many. I prefer to believe no coincidence. I prefer to believe facts. Let's go to the facts. There is two colors in between. The color red and black are in between white and pale. Impressive. Who then is working out that mystery of iniquity in such a manner, in such a way, that this pale horse already is telling of a tremendous ecumenical revival. I said ecumenical revival. Listen to this. The name that set on him was death and hell followed with him. Tremendous. That means there is a amount of people following following this rider and a tremendous amount of people mm, that has made that horse under that color 
using millions and millions and millions and has been over billions and trillions of people throughout 1600 years of history of the Roman Catholic system. 1600 years. Over billions and trillions of people has been the last flag. It's the only flag in the whole world. You can see that we can dismiss coincidence, huh? Because this is the only flag of any government. Amazing? It's the only flag. There, as a matter of fact, there is no other flag that is similar, not even similar. No from any history, not from any government, no from any empire or government has ever has the world and human race have come to know a flag so particular, so unique as the Vatican flag, white and pale. On this, we can understand, based on this, we can understand that prophecy is something that we not only can read, that we not only can hear, but we can see. Prophecy at this point in time today, we see taking place before our very eyes. Now, these colors uh, has been taken for granted. I mean, even the colors, not only the riders, not only the commissioner of the rider, has been taken for granted under false prophecies and false prophets and under false interpretations. You see, the only truly interpretation of this prophecy is right and the prophecy. You know what the interpretation of prophecies are? You know what the interpretation of a prophecy is? When you see the prophecy being fulfilled, that already is the true interpretation. But there is so much being said that you cannot see, so much of being written that you cannot even encounter, that you cannot even imagine, so much theory about things that God is, be, is fulfilling through prophecy today. When we hear about color, all what we have to do is to look around us, right in our contemporary history, right through past history, just look around, don't go into future history, leave it to God, go to past history, go to present history, and begin to see, begin to see, no more reading, no more hearing, begin to see what you hear, what for so long you have read. Begin to see it. This is why the emphasis is come and see. Come and see. Not come and hear, no more. Not come and read, no more. Come and see. There is color in this prophecy. There is color in this horse. Why we don't look for color? Simple as that. Look for colors. Just leave numbers around, leave interpretations around, just look for what literally the Bible is speaking about. If it's said for color white, let's look for color white. Let's identify whatever is color white, then let's identify who is wearing color white, who is dressing in white. If when we call for color red, let's look color red, let's begin to look. Children can understand even this prophecy if you were about to believe it. You don't have to wait your children to become, just tell them to begin to look for symbolic, not the symbol of red. What is that? Who is wearing this symbol? What has been the role of red in past history? What has been the role? What has been the role? As the role of why? Where has been the emphasis of red? All the political powers. Every major political power has taken red as the identity color of power, of destruction. They did it, the Babylonians, beginning with the old Babylonia. You can see the relationship with the present Babylon, the Vatican. Always the cardinals, what color use? Red. Impressive? No, it's reality. Why? Why not the priest? No, they don't allow the priest because the priest do not have the power that a cardinal have. That is why. It's not just because they like red color, it's because they have power that a priest doesn't have. Why? Colors have meaning and have prophetical meaning. You better believe it. Why the black horse? 
Let's look for a black color. Let's look around. Who has been wearing color as a symbol of power? Black. Again, from Babylonia down to the Roman Empire, down to fascism, down to communism. Even until today. Now, what happened with black color? But then we see by the characteristic of the commission of this rider of the black horse that we knew who was the rider. We knew who was the rider of the white horse as the papacy. We knew who was the rider of the red horse as the political power that is back in the papacy, has been always back in the papacy, behind the popes of Rome, in different countries, under different reigns and empires and governments. And then we see the rider of the black horse as the most potential mystical power that ever has Satan displayed on planet Earth. That was Ignatius of Loyola. This is why it was not a name on the rider, because it's not just Ignatius of Loyola, but the general Jesuits. You see, they kept a succession of generals as the popes. The only two dynasties in the world that fulfilled this process. No other religious organization, no other religious order have that identity, only the Jesuit order. He had his own general appointed by the one before he died, and his own will, he stayed, who is going to be his successor. Listen to this. The black pope. Now we're getting closer. To what? To what even in natural Jola? Profess before the Inquisitor were about to kill him, to burn him alive, before Pope Pius III accept the Constitution of the Jesuit Order and accept for the first time in history in 1541 the Jesuit Order as the Company of Jesus, as the militia of the Pope. Now, Pope Paul III was glad to hear that, that he got an army now, that he got a militia now. Even in Nessio Loyola went as far as telling him, now for our church, that is the pale horse, there you understand better. Now for our church, we will have the greatest protection, because once the, the papacy is protected, the Roman Catholic system as a whole will be protected. The papacy is not protected, then the whole system will collapse without the papacy. You understand now why they became the militia of the Pope. Because becoming the militia of the Pope, such a religious order, above the Dominicans, above the Franciscans, above every other religious order, they will take care of things that the other religious order could not take care. For instance, conspiracy against governments. This is why you hear me say, under the prophecy of the rider of the black horse, that the Jesuit order is the only religious order that has been spelled from more than 60 to 80 countries over around the world and what have a 500 years of history. How come? Were these Protestant governments that spelled this really order? No. They were Roman Catholic people in government. They themselves fear the order. What they discover? What they discover? They discover a lot. Some of that will show you among the covers of the many books, one of them dealing with many of the branches of the Jesuit order, among others the Opus Dei. Dealing with the economy of the country. Dealing with the politicians of every country. The Opus Dei. Among others, branches of the Jesuit order among the laymen. They are conspiring against economy, they are conspiring against law, they are conspiring against science, they are conspiring against education, they are manipulated. Every factor of life in the education and preparation of human to conspire against their very souls. To make everybody a Catholic regardless of how. As a matter of fact, another branch of the Jesuit order is the Legion of Mary not only, but the Nines of Columbus, the Nines of Columbus, yes, the Nines of Columbus, precisely, is the Nines of Columbus one of the branches of the Jesuit order that 
stand upon a special principle. What is that principle? What is that, that, uh, that secret code of the Knights of Columbus? In the United States, as they have in other countries in the United States, they use a word called defining their goals. And they said this way, America Catholic, and their own code, and their own secret code, America Catholic. What that means is, this is their goal. This is the, what they pursue. They pursue to make not only America Catholic, but every other country over this planet. Now, the rider of the white horse already fulfill under God's own judgment, fulfill the prophecy concerning the Roman Catholic system. What is that meaning of this prophecy concerning, relate to the Roman Catholic system as a whole? We are not talking about the Roman Catholic system only from the point of view of the Roman Catholic traditions, of the Roman Catholic liturgy, of the Roman Catholic sacraments, of the Roman Catholic patristic. We are speaking about the Roman Catholic system the mother with her daughter, that is the writer of the pale horn, not only in his commission, but that is the pale horn himself. Listen to this. The ecumenical moment, the charismatic moment that now has tried to replace, even if they could, the work and the ministry and the gift and the operations of the Holy Spirit given only to the Church of Christ. Right now, under all these pretensions and imitations, even of the gift and operations and ministry of the Holy Spirit, right now, an ecumenical revival is taking place around these premises. Joining of every force, you hear even preachers and evangelists, right now, not tomorrow, nor in the future, nor in the kingdom of the Antichrist, right now, you hear men call men of God, saying, regardless whether you are Roman Catholic, or you are a Methodist, or you are a Baptist, you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you are Catholic, you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you are still a good Christian, being Catholic. <gasps> you see, we are not too far from a tremendous manifestation of the conclusion as a climax of these prophecies, of this prophetical commission of these four horsemen. We are about to come to that conclusion. Just listen to this. Let's go immediately to chapter 17 of the book of Revelation and let's see how the pale horse is being formed. It's being formed. That is what it is. It's being formed. Who made up the pale horse? As the, who made up the white horse and the red horse and the black horse? We already saw to the same commissions they are carrying out throughout the earth, throughout the planet, the pale horse through their own commission. What is the commission of the pale horse? Yes, first is to bring death and as a result to bring those who die not to life, not to eternal life, but to hell. Not to heaven, but to hell. That is the commission. Can you imagine? What a horrifying commission. What a horrifying mission. What a horrifying goal to pursue throughout so much religious revival. Listen to this. Chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. And there came one of the seven angels which have the seven vials and talk with me saying unto me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great hall that sit upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the colors are coming again in prophecy. Now it's not only white, now it's not only red, now it's not only black, now it's not only pale, but now it's a scarlet. Listen to this, a scarlet. Now come with me further. And verse 4, and the woman was arrayed in purple, 
<gasps> another color, another color. It's too many coincidences here. If you were to believe that these are plain coincidences, then again and again we are coming across too many coincidences. We better go and believe facts again. What these colors identify in contemporary history? What this color has identified? And with what this color has been identified throughout the history of the Roman Catholic institution? Purple and scarlet with the powers that prepare cardinals to become popes. This is where the two colors join between the cardinal college and the papacy. Purple and scarlet. Is that making the church? That is making the church. Do you know how the church is being defined under canon law, under the laws of the Roman Catholic institution, under the constitution of the Vatican? Do you know how the church is defined? Who is the church? You ask, and dogmatology, and they answer you immediately. The church is not just the body of the believer. The church is the hierarchy. That is the church. As a matter of fact, they call the cardinal college the sacred family. It's the family. See, as the gangsters, the gangsters call themselves family. See, the Cosa Nostra is a family. <gasps> See, the Mafia always have good learning from Catholic teaching. Always. Some of you, you are to watch even the pictures and the films, and you will find that such identity throughout the history, not only of Catholic teaching, but of the Mafia, of the gangsters. What this family is all about? This family is not alone. This family was made up of a woman that is an imitator of the Church of Christ become a prostitute. And become not only a prostitute, but become the greatest prostitute of them all. The book of Revelation called her the Grey Whore. Huh? Not just a whore, the Grey Whore. This is not just Babylon, it's the Grey Babylon. This, uh, this is what the word said. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stone and pearl, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. There is the connection. The connection of the rider of the pay hall and the pay hall and the commissions of the rider of that pay hall. They are the connections right here. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That very rider and that very horse, the pale horse, has been riding all the way from Babylon. Watch the map, see the map, see the geography, all the way from what today seems to be Iraq, all the way from the desert to the seven mountains where the woman is sitting. Beloved, the woman is no longer sitting upon the beast in the desert. The woman today is sitting upon seven mountains. This is why the identity of the colors give us to know where the woman is and who she is. Listen to this again. Come with me. Now read verse 5. And upon her for her was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. This is no Babylon the All. This is Babylon the Great. Beloved, this is not Iraq. This is not the Old Babylon that is going to be rebuilt. That is a lie of the devil. That is another cover-up. That is another sign of drunkenness upon those who even professing to know Christ, professing to believe the gospel. They are still drunk under the wine of the fornication of the great whore. Listen to this. Let's read with me verse 9. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The mind which has wisdom. This is not Terrenal wisdom. This is not earthly wisdom. This is not carnal wisdom. This is wisdom of God. This is divine wisdom. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman seated is no longer 
and the desert as verse 3 said there was upon the beast upon political power being carried out as we said from the first time that we read now this woman is being carried under political power or upon political power already she was getting as an inheritance the political power that she received all the way from the mystical powers of Babylon the all coming from Babylon the all even from that geographical point now coming to sit upon seven mountains upon seven mountains where are seven mountains where in Iraq can you find me seven mountains in the desert of Iraq can you find me seven mountains in the desert of Persia? I'm going to the old empire that some people said they are going to be revealed. Well, they may be revealed, but they never will reveal upon seven mountains. God will have to create seven mountains. But you see, God already has seven mountains here in geography. They are in Italy. As a matter of fact, not in any part of Italy, specifically, these seven mountains were where Rome was built upon. And where now the Rome no longer is there. And the form of the political Roman Empire is the Vatican. The very buildings, even the buildings, the buildings that once occupied the Roman Empire is being occupied by the buildings of the Vatican. This is not coincidence. Too much. This is literal fulfillment of prophecy. The woman is sitting upon seven mountains. I have a question that has challenged my own soul once that I was a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. That question challenged my soul. It was do I know as a Roman Catholic priest, as a Jesuit priest, there was more mystical than any other priest, Jesuits always, especially on the Orthodox. doctrine. They have the mystical power the other priests doesn't have. They have a special exercise the other religious orders doesn't have. They have seven steps of visualization called the seven exercises of Ignatius of Rosola. <gasps> He put you in touch with everything in heaven and hell and the purgatory and limbo, everything. <gasps> Terrific. And even so, with such a satanic laugh, because that is why the devil was laughing at my own soul, and the conviction that I had about what was deceit. Listen to this. In my own life as a Roman Catholic priest, the question that came to my soul, to my own consciousness, led of the Spirit of God, there's no doubt about, to the scripture was, do you know anyone before you and the whole Roman Catholic clergy, beginning with the popes of Rome, do you know of any even one pope that could testify that he was saved while he was alive? I'm not talking about after his death, I'm talking about whether I knew at least a pope, not even a Roman Catholic, a layman, not even a priest, not a bishop, not a cardinal, at least a pope that could testify that was saved while he was alive. Do you know there is no one? <gasps> do you know there is no one not only? But do you know that not even the pope, a pope, can claim can claim to say that he is saved because even the very profession or declaration or confession of that particular pope that he is saved by Jesus Christ by fact and power of his blood that pope already is a heretic on the Roman Catholic teaching and tradition there is only death and you see that after death, if there is no promise of life by the gospel, then is hell. The Lord Jesus said to his apostles, go ye into the world and preach the gospel. He never said go ye into the world and preach baptismal and preach 
sacraments and preach liturgy and preach theology and preach philosophy and preach political ideas and preach and promote and persuade people about moral issues. The Lord Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel, the gospel. You want to have solutions even for abortion? You don't have to force governments to implement laws about it. Just preach the gospel. And abortion will stop. At least will stop to those that believe the gospel. You don't have to force. Oh, oh no force? No. Absolutely. Jesus said, go ye into the world. You don't even have money from the church, from the ties of people, and paying for politicians to vote and favor a legislation of anything. I say, of anything. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. If the politicians are not able to be persuaded by the preaching of the gospel of what they are to be, their duties, you don't wear it. You never get it through money, through payment, through donation, through give, to vote. Never, never, never. That politician must be a born-again person. Not just a religious person calling themselves born again. It's different. Listen to this. You must go to the Great Commission in order to understand who is the pale horse. Where is the pale horse? Who is riding the pale horse? What this commission is all about? It's only death, it's only hell. There is no even shadow of life. No even a shadow of life. The same thing that you find in Roman Catholic tradition. There is no shadow of life. Let me go quickly on the sacraments alone. Seven sacraments. Do you see any shadow of life when you partake of a sacrament? Or even when you partake of the six sacraments or one of the seven? Did you see even a very bit of shadow of life? No. On the contrary. Entertainment about life. They tell you that through the sacraments, the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of Christ is coming to your life. Rather than preaching the gospel to every creature that has gone upon this planet, that has gone riding, riding as a pale horse, bringing death, no life, and getting the people that receive death into hell with every one of them. Every priest, every nun, every monk, every bishop, every cardinal that has come around this planet, every country, from South America to Central America to the Caribbean to Europe, to every country, every country that have received Catholicism during the past 500 years, and even before in all Europe, every country has still waited for a shadow of life from Catholicism. All what they have received century after century, even today, uh, beside the renewal, beside the charismatic renewal, they're still pending to be saved sometime. They don't know when. They don't know when they will be saved. Someday, they tell. Someday, you will be saved. As a matter of fact, there is so much of doubt that you can be saved here on earth by the grace of Christ through faith alone. There is so much of doubt. There is so much of rebellion against the gospel. There is so much disobedience to the gospel and promises of Christ. There is so much of denial of the love of God that one said, because God so loved the world that has given His begotten Son, that you may believe and have eternal life. No death, eternal life. So much of denial of the promises and love of God, that even until this very day, the most charismatic of people, they are still in need. After they lie saying they are saved, you know what they say? We are saved now. We are Christian, but we are better Catholics than before. We need to go to Mass now more than never before. We need to go to do penance more than never before. Beloved, that is the seat of the highest grade, of the highest degree. That is pale. Death is her name. 
the name of that horse, of his name, is death, and hell follow with him. This is not a gospel. This is not what you are called to believe. You are called to believe in the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter 19. He said that he is the life, Christ himself. No one of these four riders could, could, could replace Christ. No one of them. No all the four together brought one single shadow of life. Not even hope of life. Not even hope. Once you partake of the sacraments of the liturgy, of the traditions of the Roman Catholic institution, you become not only a Roman Catholic person, you become a Roman citizen, a citizen of the Vatican, another nation, another country, another government, another constitution. Not only you are not a real citizen of your own country, now you are not even a citizen of the kingdom of God. Not even a citizen of the kingdom of God. You must come, not to be close to the kingdom, but you must come inside the kingdom. As I pass on to you this invitation, as the Holy Spirit passed on to me when I was converted to the gospel, when I was convicted of the Holy Spirit, I pray that this may be so with you. That you may open your heart, you may open your mind, to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other Savior, there is no other Lord, there is no other meditator between God and yourself except Jesus Christ. Every other bit of liturgy, every other bit of historical religion, every other bit of tradition, religious tradition, will interfere with that meditator between God and yourself, will interfere with Christ and His grace. By grace are you saved. That is the message. That is the gospel. By grace are you saved. Now, now, not later, not even a second later. Now you can be recipient of Christ's grace through faith and faith alone in the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May the Lord bless you, prosper you, keep you, and set you free through the blood of Jesus Christ as a new born again person as a new child of God, coming to the kingdom of God. I pray not only for you, but for your family. I pray for you as a Christian, that you may be a better witness of Jesus Christ, and in, in such a fashion that Roman Catholic people around the world may know who is a Christian. Once they see you, they see Christ, they see the gospel, they see the prophets being fulfilled before their very eyes. You must make even the non-believer able to see what is being fulfilled of God right here on earth and now. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, O most dear God and Lord, Master and Savior, in the name of Jesus Christ thy Son, according to his own promise I come before thee, interceding and praying, not only but with thanksgiving in my heart for my salvation. The joy of my own salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement and his sacrifice for me and the power of his blood that redeemed and set me free. Now bring me with confidence before thy throne of grace in order to pray and intercede for those who now need Christ and need salvation and need eternal life, that they may be separated from death and hell as they are now under true traditions and religion. Set them free, Lord, set them apart, and make them members of the body of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord and Savior as they are being redeemed, as they confess Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, now 